Greetings, everyone. Yes, I'm coming on camera slowly here, I think. It is um, great to be here with you. I am, let's see how we can make sure we have our camera situated right here. Um, let's see, I'm Joyce Davis and I'm President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg, but I don't see that we have our camera here correctly. Um, well, we're in for, I think, a very interesting conversation um, in that we're going to be discussing with Dr. Michael Meyer a uh, climate change technology. And that is an intro, all, all things technology are quite interesting and important in our world today. But before I'll just say hello to Dr. Meyer. It's good to have you here, Dr. Meyer. How are you? Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent, excellent. And I see you have all the branding for Harrisburg University, a cutting edge school behind you. It's great to have you here. But before we go in and I, I read to you a little bit and give you a little bit more about Dr. Maya's expertise, uh, we're going to watch the, the uh, video that, that's prepared by Great Decisions by the Foreign Policy Association. And, um, and then we will, I'll introduce him and then we will hear what he has to say about that and about this topic in general. And then we will get your cue, your questions asked and hopefully answered by someone who knows what he's talking about. So with that, we will uh, sign off and let Michelle take it away and show the, the Great Decisions video first. The United States stands at this time at the pinnacle of world power. It is a solemn moment for the American democracy. For with primacy in power is also joined an awe-inspiring accountability to the future. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Great Decisions Masterclass. In week one, we looked at the thorny geopolitical challenge of Middle East realignment. Today, we consider a very different topic, climate technology. If you think about all of the topics that have populated great decisions over the decades, they generally fall into three categories. There are the perennial challenges that we look at almost every year, the routine foreign policy challenges, and then finally, the topics that might be considered outliers, only occasionally making their way into the handbook. I gave my first Great Decisions lecture in 1987. Back then, the perennial challenge was the Soviet Union. It was a topic in and of itself each and every year, and it also influenced most all of the other topics considered. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, that topic went away, and today it's been replaced by China. Trade policy is more of a routine Great Decisions. We consider it every four or five years. It doesn't change as quickly as relations would with the old Soviet Union or today's China. A few years ago, we looked at outer space. First time it had ever been a great decisions topic. It was an outlier. We may or may not consider outer space in future lectures. Climate change early on appeared to be an outlier. It was considered decades ago and then a great deal of time passed before we return to it. But of late, climate change and climate-related topics have been annual considerations in the Great Decision series. It is becoming a routine foreign policy challenge. Today, we'll take three main considerations about climate technology and competition before considering U.S. foreign policy options. We'll look at the concepts and the consequences of climate change climate nationalism, and then finally we'll struggle with the question, should we act alone or work with others in addressing ecological challenges and climate change? We begin with the concepts. Early on, and by that I mean the 1990s, most of the focus was on the concept of global warming. This was somewhat problematic because climate change isn't just about the planet getting warmer, it's about disruptions in the normal patterns of weather behavior. Therefore, we shifted from global warming to climate change. 
Climate change has become a highly politicized issue. One political party has historically denied it. The other has argued it is among the most pressing of issues confronting humanity. So today we often use the concept of extreme weather. All of it, of course, produced by climate change, but nonetheless, it's an issue that we can all get our arms around, understand, oftentimes we feel it ourselves in our neighborhoods, and therefore that becomes a more useful concept for the debate. Whatever we call it, the planet is getting warmer. The empirical data is clear. Year after year, the temperatures tend to go up. You'll see from this graph that 2023 was the third highest on record in Central Texas, but that also reflects the global pattern as well. And most of the hottest years on record have occurred in the past decade. Climate change has enormous implications for us individually, as a nation state, and a global community. The medical and physical health of people is affected. Community health, of course, is affected as well. Not to mention the global instability that can result from massive changes in weather and patterns. The Pentagon is taking this issue very seriously. Under successive administrations, it is preparing for the reality that some regions of the world will become unstable as a result of changing weather. Take a look at Syria as an example. This is a country that's fallen into a more than decades-long civil war that has devastated society. You might recall from my previous lecture, Syria is in one of those weakened state categories. And that's a result in part of climate change because it all began with a series of droughts. Droughts that forced the farmers off the land, into the cities. They protested against the government. The dictatorial regime did not take that lightly. It responded. And before you know it, we had a civil war unfolding in the country. What began as a series of peaceful protests against the repressive regime of Bashar al-Assad has turned into a brutal civil war. Over 100,000 people have been killed. Millions have fled the country. Much weakened is the state of Syria as a result, opening the door for the Islamic State to enter and create havoc. This shows us that climate change locally and internationally can have very significant implications for world order and international politics. The concept of climate technology, what we mean is those technologies that accelerate our efforts to decarbonize the world. We would like to reduce the amount of carbonization and therefore technologies are required, the aim being a net zero. The problem is that these technologies are incredibly difficult to discover and to adapt to our many needs in industry and modern life. And as a result of that, most companies that contribute to the carbon problem don't have access to them. As a result, government assistance is likely necessary. This creates a real dilemma for those of us in the capitalist world because government involvement in industry development runs counter to the basic principles of supply and demand, market principles in capitalism. No doubt, the fastest way to get to a global net zero would be if universities around the world, research institutions, corporations, all others investigating climate change and efforts to mitigate it could cooperate with one another share their findings and research, their ideas, all of the things that they do professionally would be much accelerated if they could work together seamlessly. The problem that we have in world politics is that the global system is divided into sovereign nation states. And where national boundaries cross, oftentimes the lines of communication will be diminished. Countries are concerned about losing their competitive edge if they allow their technologies and their discoveries to escape their national boundaries. To share or not to share is the question. If we share our technological breakthroughs, that, as noted earlier, is probably the fastest path to net zero, but it also holds with it the possibility that other countries and their corporations will gain an economic benefit over us. 
These technological discoveries are incredibly important on so many different levels, well beyond climate change battles. They're also very important for commercialization, for profit making, for discovery of new products and cornering the market. And as a result, nations are very reluctant to allow other countries and their companies to have the secrets that we have discovered. Next, we look at the concept of climate nationalism, a relatively new concept in world affairs. What we know for absolute certainty is that the climate is changing. There's an overwhelming belief that it's being caused by human behavior, but putting that aside, let's just acknowledge that the climate is changing and it is creating problems that are multinational. And anytime you have a problem that crosses international boundaries, very likely it cannot be solved within one country. The solutions that we seek are going to be found globally, whether through cooperation in technological investigation or through some sort of a regulation in the form of an international agreement. But nations are sovereign. And as sovereign nations, they think differently than the world as a whole. It means that they're going to be relatively narrow-minded. What is important to us? How is climate change affecting us directly? And what are the near-term concerns that we should be interested in? Nation states oftentimes prioritize their short-term interest over the long-term interest of a region or the international system. This is particularly the case in democracies, where elections are held every two, four, or five years. It's very hard to run for re-election, promising to fix the world over the long haul. Most citizens, most voters, want to hear what you've done lately and what you'll do in the near future. Therefore, nation states are very protective of their technologies, of their discoveries, and of the things that the world might need to know about if we were to collectively combat climate change. Competition is fierce, of course. Where there's technology and discovery, there may be the solution to our climate change challenge. We may be able to resolve the problems we're experiencing someday with the application of scientific investigation, new technologies, and new ways of mitigating the implications of climate change. I've long given up hope that the international community will fundamentally change its day-to-day -day behavior. We're still going to drive automobiles. We'll still have industries. We'll do the sorts of things that put CO2 into the air. But if we are able to capitalize on our intellectual capital, if we're able to use our scientific discoveries to mitigate those problems or perhaps even resolve them at their core, that would be a tremendous breakthrough in world politics. Those technologies also give us economic advantage because they are useful in many different industries. And of course, those technologies also have a military application. Most of the commercial applications of technology began in the military wing. Investigation for weaponry, such as lasers, that made very quick application in the commercial fields. Climate nationalism, therefore, is a very real thing in world politics. Green initiatives directed by governments for the benefit of its citizens and its corporations. In other words, assisting your own nationals as opposed to assisting people from other countries, excluding them at the expense, perhaps, of speeding our path towards net zero. Two examples here in the United States of climate nationalism are the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Both of these are Biden administration policies. Together, they're directing about $800 billion in federal tax-collected money to support climate change technologies. And they're doing it on both sides of the divide, providing economic assistance to corporations to develop, for example, more efficient solar panels, but also providing on the demand side customer incentives like tax credits to buy those solar panels or electric vehicles or most any other sort of climate technology product. Incentives are limited to nationals. 
And what that immediately gives rise to is a protest from other nations that this is not only unfair, but it also violates existing free trade agreements. Since 1945, the United States has led the global liberalization of the economy. And I use the word liberal in an economic term, as in Adam Smith, in that we're pursuing a market-based economic policy reflective of capitalist principles, a reduced government role in the economy and global free trade with minimal restrictions on access to foreign markets. When our government tells its citizens and its companies, here are resources and assistance to you that we're not going to allow to others, that can very easily be construed as a violation of those various international agreements. The Europeans cried foul immediately. This is fundamentally unfair, they said, as well as illegal. We get the fact that you're fighting climate change, you're addressing issues that are near and dear to our hearts as well, but the fact of the matter is our companies are going to suffer. We don't have the same chance of selling our products in the American market because you're underwriting the American supply and demand side of the economic calculation. Should we do this alone? Is it best for us to act in a unilateral fashion? Or when we do discover things, technologies and science that would be applicable to the world, should we share them? Should we work with other countries? The theories that we have used over the course of the last couple of decades give us some direction on whether or not we should work with or against other countries. According to classic liberal thinking, this is Wilsonian internationalism, which believes that individuals are inherently good, that cooperation in world politics is possible, that peace should be considered the norm any time there's conflict in the world, then there should be a resolution to it. And that resolution is dialogue, diplomacy, and international laws that clarify what we are allowed and not allowed to do. When liberals think about trade policy, they want to work in a multilateral fashion. And this, of course, applies to climate technologies because multilateralism drives a consensus. If other countries are working with us, then they're going to have more buy-in to some sort of a global regulation that will allow a very smooth move in the direction of net zero. Conferences can be held where the issue is debated, populated by representatives of nation states as well as scientific experts. They can establish goals for the international community common across nation states and then provide a legal framework around which we all will work so that it is clear what is allowable and not allowable and a clear plan of action for moving forward. This is a classic liberal approach to a very basic question, should we work alone or work with other countries? Realist from the classic realpolitik approach, they view world politics in a very different way. To them, the world is highly competitive. Nation states are selfish and egotistical. To them, war is the normal state of affairs. It's not that realists want war to happen. They simply expect it to happen. They believe it is ingrained in our human nature and embedded in the way world politics works, especially if the international system is divided into sovereign, independent nation states. To them, unilateralism is the way to go for all trade policies, for most relations with other countries, and certainly with valuable understandings relating to science and climate technology. The realists will argue that you're only safe as a nation if you are sufficient, if you don't need other countries to provide your security or the basic resources for your economy. Unlike the liberals, who believe there's a positive sum relationship in world politics, meaning that every nation can win at the same time, the realists believe in zero-sum games. If we win, it is at the expense of another country, and if they win, by definition, we have just lost. So these technologies are incredibly valuable, 
We don't want to share them with other countries, and we certainly don't want to sacrifice our sovereignty for the betterment of a global system that really is broken down into sovereign, selfish, war-prone nation states. And then finally, we have the more recent popularize of the America First argument in foreign policy. They also argue in favor of unilateralism, but for a different reason. They want to protect American jobs. They feel that the series of international trade agreements, some of them regional like NAFTA, many of them international, have undermined American competitiveness. And they argue this for two reasons. Number one, labor abroad is much less expensive than here in the United States. That creates an unfair advantage. And number two, other countries, their governments, are supporting their domestic industry in violation of free trade agreements. So the United States really must begin to do the same thing. Close off its border to international trade, pump money into American industry, bring back the heartland, and revive the Rust Belt. Foreign policy options? Well, our calculation on climate change and its mitigation is going to include factors such as, will those two countries participate? Yes, we can make changes to our lifestyle. We can invest in climate technology. Will China and India do the same? They're among the biggest emitters of CO2. Shouldn't they be chipping in to help with the scientific investigation and also changing the way that they do business? How much is it ultimately going to cost? And can we even afford this sort of an investment? The national debt numbers in 2023 are just shocking. $1.7 trillion added to our national debt in one year's time. Can the issue even be resolved? Is it possible to find the scientific breakthrough in time to save the world from the climate change trend line? And then there's the thorny issue of domestic politics, where we simply don't have a national consensus on what to do about climate change and whether or not the government should be in the business of supporting companies and scientists as well as consumers in moving forward in a clean energy environment. America is deeply divided. You've got the optimists who believe we can do this, as well as the deniers who say we're not responsible for climate change. It's just natural that the weather patterns are altered. You've got the pragmatists who say, look, even if we could do it, Without the rest of the world, and especially the others, like India, China, and Russia on board, would it really matter? And then finally, there are the nationalists who say, I'm okay with investing, but it has to stay in the United States, benefit Americans and American corporations. If you look at the global emissions of CO2, the United States, China, Russia, India, Japan, very close to the top. We would need all of them on board at a minimum in order to collectively and multilaterally resolve the climate change challenge. There is, however, a new way of looking at competition. As opposed to always thinking that it's a zero-sum game, history tells us that may actually not be the case. So there is indeed a great deal of competition between the U.S. and China relating to technologies addressing the climate. The standard way of looking at this is that it's a zero-sum game. Either we or China will win. But the Cold War tells us that, in reality, we both may win if we work together. During the Cold War struggle, which was much more intense, more ideologically driven, more conflictual than the U.S.-China relationship today, that competition produced a lot of positive things for the world the race to the moon and all the scientific discovery related to it. Civilian nuclear energy was part of that competition, as well as efforts by both sides to pull people out of poverty and to make their lives better so that we could show we are better than the communist Soviet Union. So competition may actually be a very good thing, and perhaps we should allow other countries to join us in the search for climate change technologies. Rivalries oftentimes spur benefits. China and the U.S. is no exception because this is a different struggle. 
This is not a struggle about ideology. It's a struggle about role models. Which do you view as a more appropriate ally, the United States or the People's Republic of China? Countries all over the world are asking that question. Because the U.S. is doing such a better job than China, along with the Europeans, in pursuing clean energy, the Chinese know full well that this puts them at the risk of being viewed as the global villain, the major violator, because countries around the world are deeply concerned about the implications of climate change. Take a region like Oceania, way out in the Pacific, where you have a host of very small island nations that are voting members of the United Nations, long American allies. There is an intense competition with China right now over loyalties in this region. You have Nauru, Tuvalu, Palau, Micronesia, Tonga. All of these countries are being wooed by Beijing, but at the same time, they're very, very worried about rising sea levels because as island nations, this is an existential threat to them. They view the Americans more favorably than they do China. That gives us an advantage. And it's not just Oceania. All over the world, there are nations very worried about climate change. And therefore, if the United States viewed climate technologies in a positive fashion, this gives us the opportunity to put a better foot forward to all of those countries whose loyalties we want. It gives us a geopolitical advantage in the world. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Until next time, stay engaged and make great decisions. Stay engaged and make great decisions. Um, that is a good uh, thing to do. Uh, but now we're going to get into our discussion here with uh, Dr. Michael Meyer. He is an assistant professor of Earth Sci System Science at Harrisburg University, where he teaches introduction to environmental science, hydrology, and soils in the critical zone courses. He also leads a scientific mind course at Harrisburg University. Harrisburg University's promotion, uh, says Dr. Meyer, is among their professors known for groundbreaking research, expertise, and amazing discoveries. And I have to tell you, he recently rocked the astronomy world, we understand, by discovering evidence of an unknown meteorite. Uh, wow, that's, that's something to brag about. He's a specialist in material science, geochemistry, and big data analysis. He's working on bringing virtual reality field trips to HU and investigating the hydrological systems of the Susquehanna River and Basin. Now, he says Earth systems are interesting because they encompass so much, and he's right, they're directly related to our everyday lives. We know Professor Meyer is ready to lead us on the most interesting discussion about climate technology. So, Dr. Meyer, take it away. Uh, thank you again for inviting me uh, here for the and giving me this opportunity. Um, so uh, it's a uh, interesting topic, uh, climate technology, and about the sort of international relationships uh, that go on with it. Um, well, one of the things that I that first struck me about uh, the video uh, and about about the the general premise uh, is that uh, there is um, a blocking of technology. Um, globally. Um, and I guess to some extent, uh, th that's a, a degree of scale, um, because actually green technology is one of the uh, most spread out technologies uh, that we have. In fact, a lot of developing countries uh, utilize green renewable technologies um, more in their everyday energy consumption and usage than we often do. Um, so uh, when it comes to like, especially small regional city or town village sort of setups, um, oftentimes those are all often green because it's much easier to have a local green resource, whether it be a small solar panel setup, a small wind farm, uh, even um, there's some very interesting, uh, you know, small dams designs that uh, are, are designed to be very low risk flooding and uh, 
other sorts of things. Um, whereas a lot of those technologies, they require so much infrastructure when you scale them up um, that it becomes out of reach for those developing uh, countries. So like um, only uh, a lot of the, you know, the most wealthiest of countries uh, can have, uh, you know, a 15 megawatt generator uh, wind turbine like they have uh, off of the Netherlands, um, you know, or wind farms uh, of, of that sort of scale. So uh, that was an interesting uh, aspect to me, because oftentimes when we look at climate problems, like a lot of the solution to decarbonization and energy production is actually very well spread out uh, from there. Uh, I didn't know if that was a, a jumping point for any questions. Or well, yeah, well, let's get started because one of the main things that um, he was speaking about in this video was the lack of cooperation. I will tell you I, that I found that a bit shocking. I somehow thought that these great scientists like you and others were actively collaborating with each other around the world. But uh, am I yeah. right that that is not really happening? Oh, no, I mean, that so scientists are very collaborative, uh, maybe almost too much at times. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, when it comes to uh, companies, uh, that's definitely where there's like proprietary issues. Um, but uh, I, I rarely see any issue among scientists on sharing any sort of, of data on this. Um, uh, a lot of times uh, when we're trying to be very innovative in that space and you're testing out prototypes and stuff, it's, it's, it's really capital that often limits uh, what uh, you do uh, when you, you know, like if you want to have an aerial wind turbine, right? Like that's actually a powered kite, which is a very mm -hmm. interesting concept. But like, you know, you can know how, how far do you get it past the prototype stage? Well, how much money can you get to raise uh, for it? Um, but like no one, no one owns that idea per se. You can kind of work on it on your own as you wish. Right. But, but I guess the, so I guess what he was saying that, and maybe he's wrong that even at the university level, countries may prohibit universities from sharing their expertise and their knowledge because they want to keep that. I mean, for example, how collaborative would are you able to be with Chinese scientists? Is there any kind of active collaboration going on between American scientists and Chinese scientists? Yeah, so there is definitely stumbling blocks uh, and that's only been getting worse uh, with like doing collaboration in Asia, uh, especially in China um, and, and Russia. Uh, those two have, have been uh, problematic. Uh, and I've, uh, I've done a lot of work in China. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of my PhD work was, was there around the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, and it's definitely, as the political situation has disintegrated uh, or at least broken down a lot, um, that has then made it, far more difficult for us to you know bring in students for them to bring in you know students or researchers so i, I will say he, he was correct on that yeah. um but i guess it, that is definitely a, a you know a political environment more so than the actual scientists themselves the actual scientists themselves you know if possible would you know easily wander back and forth and 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 share what they can um and that's where i say maybe sometimes they're actually a little too prolific in sharing, because there has definitely been times, um, you know, in at least the the, the geosciences, uh, where I can say, oh yeah, like that was probably not the best idea, <laughs> yeah. um, where they were doing stuff and got people in, you know, political hot water for what was essentially fairly mundane research work. Yeah, but the, see, that's what causes me some concern because at least the impression we're getting is that scientists can get into very deep water, political waters. And in more repressive regimes can even face probably imprisonment uh, for stepping over the line. And so, and, but, and, and then he was talking about something about climate nationalism. I mean, I'd never heard of that topic, this climate net that we want to keep what we know to ourselves. And yet that seems to defeat the purpose because as the guy says, and as you rightly know, this is one world. <laughs> it's yep. not. I can't just put a dome over Harrisburg and say we will, we have to, the air circulates around the whole globe. Is there any international organization that you know of, perhaps in the UN or, or elsewhere, trying to break down and trying to bring some sense to, to nations that they can't go this one alone? Uh, so the UN uh, and a lot of its various sub uh working groups that that is 
definitely probably one of the largest ones. The uh, the inter uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change is probably most famous uh, in that regard. Um, uh, from there, I mean, a lot of scientific uh, uh, societies, so like um, Geological Society of America. Um, uh, let's see, what are some other? I'm, I'm just thinking in the geosciences, some examples, the uh, uh, AAPG, um, some other ones. Uh, like they all have working groups as well to try to like uh, cross borders. But he, uh, the speaker in the video was in fact very uh, kind of right in that, um, it, you know, the... It is difficult to get a bunch of uh, various countries with their own, you know, their own national agendas, uh, whether it be benevolent or, or not, uh, to kind of all agree on some some things. Although that being said, I, I do think as every year goes by and, and climate change becomes something that you can't really like ignore um, thing, the, the ship has been turning. It is very slow. And there are very, there are definitely, we have a long way to go, but you you are starting to see a momentum build. Um, you're we're not to gun ho about it. Well, let, let's stop right there because I wanted to delve into that a little bit. And I'd love to hear what our participants uh, have to say. I mean, he put it out that initially, and I think he was right about this, the Republican uh, Party was politically motivated against accepting climate change. They thought by doing that, it would hurt actually American business and would hurt the existing uh, energy companies, whereas the Democrats were on the other side saying, no, climate change is real. Have we seen that divide lesson for is, is one question as far as scientists and as far as you, the impact on all this, or do we still have a political divide in accepting that climate change is real and that we have to move to do something about it? Well, yeah, that that divide does still exist. And actually, that was a uh, that particular section was a large part of my notes uh, on this because it it is interesting. Um uh is particularly um in regards to the well i guess maybe let me let me let me step back a quick second um so in regards to climate nationalism one of uh actually a, a key point for anyone um is that a lot of green energy is highly local right like you need the wind from like pennsylvania like it's hard to transport that energy long distances from where it's generated. I mean, that's just, you know, okay. how various electrical generation works. Um, you know, like you can only move it so far from a dam. You can only move it so far from the solar panel farm or whatnot. So that's hyper local. It's 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 going to be constructed, hopefully by companies and people that live in the various regions that are going to utilize that, that power. Um, and, and the nice part is, right, is that then that power is, all like American made, right? You don't have to worry. No one is going to hopefully, uh, you know, like start to put a price on sunshine or anything like that. <laughs> you never uh, know. <laughs> yeah, uh, that you know, I'm, I've seen yeah. enough that you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put a cautionary bit on that. Uh, so, uh, so it, it is very local, um, and and it is supporting local or regional jobs. Now, to that point, then it is a little weird at times um, that. Uh, Folk, I guess, as the speaker put in, in the America First or the real the real politics sort of aspect of it, um, I, I actually never see them ever generally in favor of any sort of climate sh positive sort of stuff like green technologies or anything. I, I've been very hard pressed to find that. I feel like if I had encountered that, I would really have remembered it um, because it, it always seems uh, not the case, even though. I, that would support American jobs. That would support uh, people uh, and actually would sort of support people even over larger corporations um, because like, again, it's those people in that area that are going to get that power or utilize that energy. So um, it is a little odd uh, that that is the case, but that sadly that divide does still kind of exist. That, that divide like, exists. And you don't see, you do see it shrinking somewhat though over these years, haven't you? Or haven't... yeah, again, it's it's hard to it's hard to like have people not see what's in front of their face, you know. Um, wow. uh, actually, as, as a example, if we all remember last summer, uh, the delightful wildfire smoke, right? Um, oh, yeah. I remember uh, one day, you know, I, I have a dog. He he's got to go for a walk. It was. Not a good day out, but, you know, I got to take him for a walk because we've been stuck in the house for a little bit. 
um, you know, don some, you know, breathing stuff because, you know, it's smoke and I just don't want to breathe that in, you know, and I took it out and wandered my community as a little, you know, park nearby it and stuff. Uh, and two uh, uh, older residents um, were actually arguing about the current thing where one was saying to the other uh, that like, why, why are you wearing any of this, this, you know, like a mask or something like just, you know, the, the news or whatever is trying to get you to worry about this. And then the, the other person was like, what are you talking about? Like, we are literally like, look around what is going on. Like, I don't, it's, it's here. We're right in front of your face. Like there's smoke and particles. Like you should probably not try to breathe that. And so um, like, it's getting to the point with a lot of these things where people can't disassociate that they're like ah oh, well now i have to deal with wildfire smoke or you know no snow in particularly our region and whatnot so uh it is it is turning again but it's just a little slow right right well let's step a, a back a little bit too to talk about that during the during the development of nuclear energy right as far as you recall, was there international cooperation in sharing knowledge on this or did or was there just competition in each one of the major powers that we're going to do it on our own and um, not share and not teach and not also create safeguards, share the safety information? Is that what happened during the nuclear age? Uh, when nuclear energy first started to like be used as a utility, uh, yeah, the de various nations that had that ability um, definitely didn't want it spreading. When they did spread it, it was often um, under a lot of guidance and oversight. Um, and you had to really make sure that you knew kind of the other person. And then, of course, as... at you, there's only so much that you can kind of keep behind the curtain at times. People did figure it out. And so that knowledge spread. Um, and so now, you know, you have many countries that are nuclear powers, even if we, the United States government didn't wish that they were, they had them. Um, but nuclear, I mean, nuclear power is, a. am surprised that didn't get more play in this mm -hmm. as things go, because uh, I, I'm a huge fan uh, of nuclear power. Um, I understand the reasons they had to shut down uh, Three Mile Island um, and such, uh, but uh, it is a, a large way to decarbonize energy. The real problem is with nuclear that we haven't done any new reactors for very legitimate reasons at times. So that means that like most of our reactors that are online today, much like Three Mile Island, they're basically generation one. Like yeah. these are ones that were made during the beginning of the Cold War. Like they are not new. Uh, they don't have, you know, any safeguards like we would have, like a, a newer generator uh, would have an actual physical incapacity to melt down because of the physics behind how it's it's put in. But like, that's expensive. People get really antsy when you're like, I want to build a new, you know, reactor. Um, and so uh, it's it's sad that that is problematic, even though it, I think it is a, a very good energy source. It's interesting that you brought that up, that we're in a new generation, even of technology with regard to nuclear energy. And that I don't think a lot of people have followed that and realized that. And I also am sensing around the world, maybe not in Germany, but in other places, another look, a return, a moving toward reconsidering nuclear as a, as a form of energy to deal with climate change. Am I right about that or is that not happening? Uh, th there, there is a reconsideration. Um, I mean, newer designs, for reactors, uh, not only uh, do they have built-in fail-safe, so they 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 can't uh, melt down, which is nice. That's that we are we know too well about that problem. Um, but uh, also uh, their uh, waste, because there is no way to do it without some waste currently. Um, but that waste is actually more recyclable, whereas a lot of these earlier ones they create nuclear waste that you can't really recycle back into the process. Um, so uh, like when they are, you know, in Europe, there's been some, you know, looking around at, at this. Uh, I mean, the U.S. has had a lot of advancement in uh, nuclear power generation. But as uh, the speaker mentioned, you know, a lot of that goes into like nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers and whatnot. Things we don't see or really interact with. But those, you know, that is that's very newfangled stuff. They don't want any of those things melting down or blowing up. And we haven't had an issue ever. Uh, because of that. And and you, you, you heard him talk about the different perspectives on the world. 
the realpolitik, the uh, America first and the liberal. And, I mean, as you look at, at those um, three, do you, first of all, do you think that's accurate in reflecting, especially as science and, and technology, is that accurate re reflecting the thought processes behind um, technology development? If you're more negative, you're going to want to guard it. If you're more positive, you're going to want to share the knowledge. Is that, do you think that's a fair assessment? Uh, a little bit. I, I did think it was, it, it was a bit of an oversimplification, but given, given the time constraints on such a video and how much you can cover, I mean, I kind of get it. Um, I, 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 I feel that in my own professional life, I generally that America first and the real politic folk all are pretty much in the same group of things. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there, but then again, that's the thing is there, there, there is some gradation to that, but when it comes to like foreign outlook and stuff, I don't, I don't necessarily know how I would even classify that. <laughs> when, when, when we were talking about protecting, when he was talking about nations wanting to protect their technology, their advancement. So talk to us a little bit about whether indeed we're hurting ourselves or really protecting ourselves by keeping uh, developments that would address climate change as secret as possible. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're obviously, any country that's doing that is gonna be hurting the rest of us. Um, it's definitely a, a, an interesting sort of chicken and egg scenario because uh, you, know, you want to hold back uh, of some science, uh, you want to hold back some developments, right, so that that we can use it. Um, but at the same point, you still do want to use that technology as a monetary leverage point, right? Like you, if we have a particular technology and other places don't, our companies are going to be able to sell that stuff to people that that want it. So. But then it gets goes out in the world, or you maybe you don't want it to go out in the world. So it's like, where where do you find the middle ground in that? But again, I guess what I'm arguing is that we're talking about basic life on the planet Earth, <laughs> right? Like, if I could only make sure that my block on Harrisburg lives, and then and everybody else can just go away, then that that would be fine. But that's not the way our world works. So that's why I'm 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 trying to get what is the thinking here that no, you can't just take care of yourself. You can't just solve COVID in my block. It has to be solved worldwide. We all have it isn't there anyone that gets that, at least in between America the United States and Europe. Is there a sense that we have to work together, at least even in the NATO alliance? Or is even that, a, they're still thinking business competition? Uh, the NATO bloc has put together some standardized sort of, you know, best practices on climate initiatives. Actually, I think a lot of that is actually more driven by the European counterparts than us uh, mm -hmm. as things go. Um, you know, they have they have a lot more regulation in that regard. Um, uh, and uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, part of this issue of people, you know, or, or countries keeping things to themselves is at times a little bit, uh, th there's a fallacy of resource valuation. Um, and that is thinking that a resource that you have access to um, is really only something that affects you. Uh, maybe, maybe one of the be best examples of that, right, is air, right? We yeah. all think air, we need it to breathe uh, and such. Um, but uh, when it comes to regulations and stuff on that, like that air goes up and there's always someone downstream of your of where the air is going. Um, and so, uh, you know, people, uh, when it comes to like carbon credits and stuff, you know, they often say, ah, oh, well, is that really doing anything? But at the same point, like any benefit they have is benefiting people elsewhere. And then at, at some point coming back around and benefiting them at the yeah. same time. Yeah. And and one other thing, too, I wanted to ask you, I mean, today in this time with so many multinational corporations um, that are conducting research, clearly research involved with climate change and, and, and how to mitigate it, is it even possible to keep things secret from what just in one country? 
countries are are simply across borders with people working across borders. Uh, yeah, it, it is hard at times to keep uh, the genie in the bottle on some <laughs> things. Because uh, once someone has a, a good idea and, and it shares it, it ends up in kind of the, the commons. Uh, and then someone's going to figure out how to kind of back engineer some things. Um, I mean, that's, that's sadly the benefit of math sometimes is that like, if you know how to use it, you can say, well, there's only so many conditions and parameters for this. So I need to work, at, you know, in this, you know, that's my area I should focus my research on and eventually you, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, uh, we have a question here too from one of our attendees who asked, do those COP conferences make any difference or are they political grandstanding is the question. Oh, uh, I do think they make quite a bit of difference. Um, I will not deny that there is political grandstanding like that. That Oh, yeah. I mean, it, like those conferences wouldn't happen if there couldn't be. I mean, right. That's that's, that's part of it. Um, but uh, they have done a lot to really bring awareness uh, to these sorts of, of issues. Um, and because they keep happening, more and more people are aware of uh, these sorts of, uh, of, you know, like what needs to be done, what's wrong with uh, various climate policies. So maybe they don't necessarily achieve the stated goals that they want to in the short term. But I think over the long term, they have been making an effect because people can, you know, readily remember, oh, yes, there was a march for this or there was a meeting over there. Um, and, you know, kind of like some of the things that go on with that. OK, well, I, I save one of the biggest questions till the end, uh, but we've got to hit you with it. What role is AI <laughs> going to play in all of this? I mean, artificial intelligence and, and the fact that it is going to spread knowledge quite quickly around the world. Uh, I believe even changing power uh, balances, but that's just me. Um, because the more power you the more knowledge you have, the more power you have. We all we all know that. And so I'm wondering this AI and this rapidly changing not access to knowledge, how is that really going to impact this competition for climate technology? Uh, I, I, it's it's going to affect it uh, as about as much as it affects everything else. Uh, one of the and since we are still very much at the beginning of it yes. uh, is that people are really uh, going to start using it for modeling purposes right off the bat for the various technologies. They're going to find out about refinements they didn't know that they could make, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, so, so there's going to be probably large percentages of improvements and efficiencies and construction um, of, of various components to like green or carbon neutral or, or you know, decarbonization technology. Uh, when it comes to you know, like actually competing with others on the global marketplace. I mean, things can get seedy real fast. You know, we haven't had a AI virus quite yet on things that for corporate espionage or that sort of stuff, or at least not that we know of. Um, so, you know, that's probably somewhere down the line uh, on things. Uh, but at least at the moment, when it comes to like production and research, that's really where we're going to see most of it um, uh, before anything else. Right. But and and it does seem like still the bottom line will be how can I make a buck or two off of this rather than how can I improve the world? <laughs> uh, yes. And, and 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 that was one of the um, the points of the climate nationalism is uh, when uh, the speaker talked about how like, oh, well, then now we have these subsidies that the government wants right. to give. Uh, and it is uh, in my notes, uh, I, I actually uh, underlined the sentence a few times that I wrote. I said it's it's hard to instigate green policy without financial incentives. Um, and that's because, you know, people are like, hey, I've been doing this how I've been doing it. Uh, and, you know, they're setting their ways and they're setting their cost structure. Um, so, like, you need something to get it going to add some competition to the mix to help start pushing people, you know, pushing stuff around. So if you were advising clearly the president, what would you, what would be your policy, your your guidance for him and how to deal with climate technology and the competition and the need to uh, collaborate on this with other nations? Uh, so, I mean, I guess one of the first things I, I would do is, is put together a, a, a more coherent national funding framework 
for green energy or or you know, decarbonization uh, technology. Um, I mean, to some extent, they've they've kind of tried to do some of this. Um, I mean, it, it's oddly easy to work on uh, these sorts of things because, like, we could just add in some mass transit. <laughs> you know, like people don't really like waiting around at the airport, uh, you know, so much, especially now with like what's going on with Boeing added a delightful, you know, spice of danger uh, to every flight. Um, so, you know, like <laughs> that, that would be fairly easy as, as things go, um, you know, like that, like those are like a lot of low cost sort of things. Um, and again, you know, that would help spur America, you know, local or American business or all of that as they build the infrastructure for such things. Um, so, so that would be my main thing is like, just give funding opportunities because really a lot of places just don't, they want to do it, but they don't have the money to do it. So really aggressively find some funding support subsidies for, yes. for, for green technology. Well, That's and and we have a, a a couple of really great examples of that from our past, right? During the Depression, uh, the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, right? Like that was a an employment program and go to any national park or even older state forests. And, you know, like what are the iconic uh, buildings or trails or something that everyone had through that? Well, it's it was built by that, you know, like that is a, a legacy that people look very, you know, much on with, you know, nostalgic oh. eyes of like, man, you know, like those, those people built something really great that still, you know, withstands uh, the test of time. We could do that sort of thing again today, I think, relatively easily. Very good. And I guess one final question Jackie is asking, what climate technologies are you most excited about when you look at the overview there? Uh, so I guess like my, my very excited, uh, technologies, uh, are, are really the, um, the energy density of batteries, which I know is kind of like, maybe not the most exciting sort of thing, uh, out there. Uh, but, um, as, uh, density increases and space decreases, right? So you can fit more power in a smaller space and for smaller weight, um, you know, that's where things are really going to reach a tipping point. Um, when it comes to transportation um, and, and such, I guess like to like a sub addendum to that is when we finally have uh, electric semi trucks and such, because so much of our air pollution problem, our CO2 emissions and whatever are, are tied to transportation, um, to local and regional transportation. The sooner we get a lot of those trucks within a a lower carbon footprint, much lower than they are now, that'll be the really when we start to make some real progress on a lot of, of multifaceted green goals. And it would make sense. It would just make sense that when we get those trucks and those batteries here, we make sure they have them in China too. <laughs> because, well, and, and <laughs> I mean, honestly. Well, yeah, well, and and that's that's an interesting you know thing. I I, I that was in my notes to to maybe mention. Uh, so actually, when it comes to battery density and stuff, right now, actually, China is generally ahead of us ah. on things. So the company Catal C A T L um, uh, is uh, maybe one of the premier battery producers uh, because they have been able to really advance some of that battery technology uh, that actually we are now kind of in an effort trying to see if we can develop similar densities and so i mean we are not far behind i do not doubt uh that and i can i have some connections in the industry that are like oh yeah we just we're still working on it um but like currently they're they're ahead of us in that partic one particular aspect got it got it well i have to tell you though i'm i'm leaving this with just shaking my head because why don't we get the big picture that um you know that we're all on this planet together and something as basic as whether the planet will survive <laughs> um, is is of interest. It, it shouldn't just break down to how much profit I can make, but whether I can make sure that everybody knows what they need to know and have what they need to have to save the planet. But, oh, well, I'm not a head of a multinational corporation or a businessman, uh, but I'm sure most scientists take that that point of view as well. Uh, yeah, they they really wish we could all just sort of get on the same page uh, about things. Um, it's it's definitely a a constant source of discussion at any of the professional conferences that I I ever go to because it, it's you know we 
we all see it. Uh, and there's actually a, um, uh, a, a term now, climate anxiety, uh, uh, yes. that, um, you know, uh, has started to come about. Um, we see it now with my students, uh, even students who are not environmental science students, they don't have to they don't they don't have to learn the, the, the sad, sorry state at times of, of the details. Um, and, you know, they get nervous about it. Um, and so uh, it, it is a, a constantly rising thing where people are like, ah, what's going to go on in the future? And, and, and because they think they don't have control or they they see that they might not have control it becomes hopeless and it becomes very depressing. Yeah. Well, we've learned some new terms here. Climate anxiety, climate nationalism we've got. And and John is saying, why cannot building regulations for warehouses require installation of solar panels on their roofs? That would be one way to, um, to he believes, to help with the uh, with climate oh. change, and with energy, clean energy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we were to put, you know, solar panels on just about every house and stuff, we would we would have a lot of um, We'd have a, we, we would not solve our energy crisis, but we would definitely be uh, much closer without any of the uh, uh, the ill effects of, of various pollution and and stuff like that. Um, I mean, it does. So that's one of the interesting things about a lot of this is that, like, as the uh, folk who don't go along with uh, the various green technologies, you know, they point out that the sun doesn't shine at night, which is quite true. I cannot deny that. Um, <laughs> and and so, you know, you you have to find a time. To, to pick up that addition, you know, but one of the, the interesting counters to that is interestingly enough, if you've ever driven by a wind farm and you're like, that thing isn't turning, they got all these big stuff and nothing is turning. What is up with that? It's actually windier at night. So those create power in that off area, which is often okay. actually hard yeah. to deal with because then they're creating a lot of power, but people aren't using them. So like there's a whole lot of in really interesting intricacies to a lot of these right. technologies. And learning how to store that power for when you mm -hmm. need it. That's mm -hmm. that's the other thing. I didn't even know I was a scientist. Look at that. <laughs> well, well, there the, uh, there is a meeting going on this Thursday at the Lancaster Science Factory about a, a proposal for a pumped storage energy facility oh. in York County um, that is ostensibly in some manner related to that like how do you make a large storage battery which is basically a, a damned lake setup sure. uh and so um that is one of the potential solutions uh it'll be interesting i'm going to be attempting to attend that uh to see kind of what's going on with it well good well when they figure that out we're going to keep it to ourselves and not tell anybody else <laughs> <laughs> With that, I want to thank you, Professor uh, Meyer, for taking time to share your expertise and your knowledge on, I think, one of the most important topics of our time, if, if not ever, on the on the face of the earth. So thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to have you back to continue this conversation at some point. Thank oh, yes. you. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed my time. Have a good evening, everybody. Everybody enjoy. Thank you. See you next week for the next Great Decisions discussion. Bye-bye.